Concerning Galadriel and Celeborn Galadriel was the daughter of Finarfin and sister of Finrod Felagund. She was welcome in Doriath because her mother, Earwin, daughter of Ulve, was Telerin and the niece of Thingol, and because the people of Finarfin had had no part in the kinslaying of Alqualande, and she became a friend of Melian. In Doriath she met Celeborn, grandson of Elmo, the brother of Thingol. For love of Celeborn, who would not leave Middle-earth, and probably with some pride of her own, for she had been one of those eager to adventure there, she did not go west at the downfall of Melkor, but crossed Ered Linden with Celeborn, and came into Eriador. When they entered that region, there were many Noldor in their following together with the grey elves and green elves. And for a while they dwelt in the country about Lake Nanuiel, even dim north of the Shire. Celeborn and Galadriel came to be regarded as Lord and Lady of the Eldar in Eriador, including the wandering companies of Nandor in origin, who had never passed west of Ered Linden and came down into Assyriand. During their sojourn near Nanuiel was born at some time between the years 350 and 400, their son Amroth. But eventually Galadriel became aware that Sauron again, as in the ancient days of the captivity of Melkor, had been left behind, or rather, since Sauron had as yet no single name, and his operations had not been perceived to proceed from a single evil spirit, prime servant of Melkor, she perceived that there was an evil controlling purpose abroad in the world, and that it seemed to proceed from a source further to the east, beyond Eriador and the Misty Mountains. Celeborn and Galadriel therefore went eastwards, about the year 700 of the Second Age, and established the, primarily but by no means solely, Noldorin realm of Eregion. It may be that Galadriel chose it because she knew of the dwarves of Khazad-dum, Moria. There were, and always remained, some dwarves on the eastern side of Ered Lindon, where the very ancient mansions of Nogrod and Belagost had been, not far from Nenuiel. But they had transferred most of their strength to Khazad Dum. Celeborn had no liking for dwarves of any race, as he showed to Gimli in Lothlorien, and never forgave them for their part in the destruction of Doriath. But it was only the host of Nogrod that took part in that assault, and it was destroyed in the Battle of Sarnathrad. The dwarves of Belagost were filled with dismay at the calamity and fear for its outcome, and this hastened their departure eastwards to Khazad-dum. Thus the dwarves of Moria may be presumed to have been innocent of the ruin of Doriath and not hostile to the elves. In any case, Galadriel was more farsighted in this than Celeborn, and she perceived from the beginning that Middle-earth could not be saved from the residue of evil that Morgoth had left behind him, save by a union of all the peoples who were in their way and in their measure opposed to him. She looked upon the dwarves also with the eye of a commander, seeing in them the finest warriors to pit against the orcs. Moreover, Galadriel was a noldo, and she had a natural sympathy with their minds and their passionate love of crafts of hand, sympathy much greater than that found among many of the Eldar. The dwarves were the children of Aule, and Galadriel, like others of the Noldor, had been a pupil of Aule and Yavanna in Valinor. Galadriel and Celeborn had in their company a Noldorin craftsman named Celebrimbor. Celebrimbor had an almost dwarvish obsession with crafts, and he soon became the chief artificer of Eregion entering into a close relationship with the dwarves of Khazad-dum, among whom his greatest friend was Narvi. Both elves and dwarves had great profit from this association, so that Eregion became far stronger, and Khazad-dum far more beautiful than either would have done alone. The building of the chief city of Eregion, Ost in Edhil, was begun about the year 750 of the Second Age. News of these things came to the ears of Sauron and increased the fears that he felt concerning the coming of the Numenorians to Linden and the coasts further south and their friendship with Gilgalad. 
And he heard tell also of Aldarion, son of Tar Meneldur, the king of Numenor, now become a great shipbuilder, who brought his vessels to haven far down into the Harad. Sauron therefore left Eriador alone for a while, and he chose the land of Mortor, as it was afterwards called, for a stronghold, as a counter to the threat of the Numenorean landings. When he felt himself to be secure, he sent emissaries to Eriador, and finally, in about the year 1200 of the Second Age, came himself, wearing the fairest form that he could contrive. But in the meantime, the power of Galadriel and Celeborn had grown, and Galadriel, assisted in this by her friendship with the dwarves of Moria, had come into contact with the Nandorin realm of Lorinand, on the other side of the Misty Mountains. This was peopled by those elves who forsook the great journey of the Eldar from Quevienen and settled in the woods of the Vale of Anduin. And it extended into the forests on both sides of the great river, including the region where afterwards was Dol Guldur. These elves had no princes or rulers, and led their lives free of care, while all Morgoth's power was concentrated in the northwest of Middle-earth. But many Sindar and Noldor came to dwell among them, and their Sindarizing under the impact of Beleriandic culture began. Galadriel, striving to counteract the machinations of Sauron, was successful in Lorinand, while in Linden Gil-galad shut out Sauron's emissaries and even Sauron himself. But Sauron had better fortune with the Noldor of Eregion, and especially with Celebrimbor, who desired in his heart to rival the skill and fame of Feanor. In Eregion, Sauron posed as an emissary of the Valar, sent by them to Middle-earth, thus anticipating the Istari, or ordered by them to remain there to give aid to the elves. He perceived at once that Galadriel would be his chief adversary and obstacle, and he endeavoured therefore to placate her, bearing her scorn with outward patience and courtesy. Sauron used all his acts upon Celebrimbor and his fellow smiths, who had formed a society or brotherhood, very powerful in Eregion, the Gwethi Myrdain. But he worked in secret, unknown to Galadriel and Celeborn. Before long, Sauron had the Gwethi Myrdain under his influence, for at first they had great profit from his instruction in secret matters of their craft. So great became his hold on the Myrdain that at length he persuaded them to revolt against Galadriel and Celeborn and to seize power in Eregion, and that was at some time between 1350 and 1400 of the Second Age. Galadriel thereupon left Eregion, and passed through Khazadum to Lorinand, taking with her Amroth and Celebrion. But Celeborn would not enter the mansions of the dwarves, and he remained behind in Eregion, disregarded by Celebrimbor. In Lorinand, Galadriel took up rule and defence against Sauron. Sauron himself departed from Eregion about the year 1500, after the Myrdain had begun the making of the Rings of Power. Now, Celebrimbor was not corrupted in heart or faith, but had accepted Sauron as what he posed to be. And when at last he discovered the existence of the One Ring, he revolted against Sauron, and went to Lorinan to take counsel once more with Galadriel. They should have destroyed all the Rings of Power at this time, but they failed to find the strength. Galadriel counselled him that the three rings of the elves should be hidden, never used, and dispersed, far from Eregion where Sauron believed them to be. It was at that time that she received Nenya, the White Ring, from Celebrimbor, and by its power the realm of Lorinand was strengthened and made beautiful. But its power upon her was great also and unforeseen, for it increased her latent desire for the sea and for return into the west, so that her joy in Middle-earth was diminished. Celebrimbor followed her counsel that the Ring of Air and the Ring of Fire should be sent out of Eregion, and he entrusted them to Gilgalad in Linden. When Sauron learned of the repentance and revolt of Celebrimbor, his disguise fell, and his wrath was revealed. And gathering a great force, he moved over Celenardon, Rohan, to the invasion of Eriador in the year 1695. 
When news of this reached Gilgalad, he sent out a force under Elrond, half-elven. But Elrond had far to go, and Sauron turned north and made at once for Eriagon. The scouts and vanguard of Sauron's host were already approaching when Celeborn made a sortie and drove them back. But though he was able to join his force to that of Elrond, they could not return to Eriagon, for Sauron's host was far greater than theirs, great enough both to hold them off and closely to invest Eregion. At last the attackers broke into Eregion with ruin and devastation and captured the chief object of Sauron's assault, the house of the Mirdain, where were their smithies and their treasures. Celebrimbor, desperate, himself withstood Sauron on the steps of the great door of the Mirdain, but he was grappled and taken captive, and the house was ransacked. There Sauron took the nine rings and other lesser works of the Mirdain, but the seven and the three he could not find. Then Celebrimbor was put to torment, and Sauron learned from him where the seven were bestowed. This Celebrimbor revealed, because neither the seven nor the nine did he value, as he valued the three. The seven and the nine were made with Sauron's aid, whereas the three were made by Celebrimbor alone, with a different power and purpose. Concerning the three rings, Sauron could learn nothing from Celebrimbor, and he had him put to death. But he guessed the truth, that the three had been committed to elvish guardians, and that must mean to Galadriel and Gilgalad. In black anger he turned back to battle, and bearing as a banner Celebrimbor's body hung upon a pole, shot through with orc arrows, he turned upon the forces of Elrond. Elrond had gathered such few of the elves of Eregion as had escaped, but he had no force to withstand the onset. He would indeed have been overwhelmed had not Sauron's hosts been attacked in the rear, for Durin sent out a force of dwarves from khazad and with them came elves of Lorinand, led by Amroth. Elrond was able to extricate himself, but he was forced away northwards. And it was at that time that he established a refuge and stronghold at Imladris, Rivendell. Sauron withdrew the pursuit of Elrond, and turned upon the dwarves and the elves of Lorinand, whom he drove back. But the gates of Moria were shut, and he could not enter. Ever afterwards Moria had Sauron's hate, and all orcs were commanded to harry dwarves whenever they might. But now Sauron attempted to gain the mastery of Eriador. Lorinand could wait. But as he ravaged the lands, slaying or drawing off all the small groups of men and hunting the remaining elves, many fled to swell Elrond's host to the northward. Now Sauron's immediate purpose was to take Linden, where he believed that he had most chance of seizing one or more of the three rings. And he called in, therefore, his scattered forces and marched west toward the land of Gilgalad, ravaging as he went. But his force was weakened by the necessity of leaving a strong detachment to contain Elrond and prevent him coming down upon his rear. Now for long years the Numenorians had brought in their ships to the Grey Havens, and there they were welcome. As soon as Gilgalad began to fear that Sauron would come with open war into Eriador, he sent messages to Numenor. And on the shores of Linden the Numenorians began to build up a force and supplies for war. In 1695, when Sauron invaded Eriador, Gilgalad called on Numenor for aid. Then Tar Minastir, the king, sent out a great navy. But it was delayed and did not reach the coasts of Middle-earth until the year 1700. By that time Sauron had mastered all Eriador, save only besieged Imladris, and had reached the line of the river Lun. He had summoned more forces, which were approaching from the southeast, and were indeed in Eredwaith at the crossing of Tharbad, that was only lightly held. Gil-Galad and the Numenorians were holding at the Lun, in desperate defence of the Grey Havens, when, in the very nick of time, the great armament of Tar Minastir came in, and Sauron's host was heavily defeated and driven back. The Numenorian admiral Kiriatur sent part of his ships to make a landing further to the south. 
Sauron was driven away southeast after great slaughter at Sauron Ford, the crossing of the Baron Duin. And though strengthened by his force at Tharbad, he suddenly found a host of the Numenorians again in his rear, for Kiriatur had put a strong force ashore at the mouth of the Guathlo, Grey Flood, where there was a small Numenorian harbour. In the Battle of the Guathlo, Sauron was routed utterly, and he himself only narrowly escaped. His small remaining force was assailed in the east of Calenardon, and he, with no more than a bodyguard, fled to the region afterwards called Dagorlad, Battle Plain, Whence, broken and humiliated, he returned to Mordor and vowed vengeance upon Númenor. The army that was besieging Imladris was caught between Elrond and Gilgalad and was utterly destroyed. Eriador was cleared of the enemy, but lay largely in ruins. At this time the first council was held, and it was there determined that an elvish stronghold in the east of Eriador should be maintained at Imladris rather than in Eregion. At that time also Gilgalad gave Vilja the Blue Ring to Elrond and appointed him to be his vice-regent in Eriador. But the Red Ring he kept until he gave it to Círdan when he set out from Linden in the days of the Last Alliance. For many years the Westlands had peace and time in which to heal their wounds but the Numenorians had tasted power in Middle-earth, and from that time forward they began to make permanent settlements on the western coasts, becoming too powerful for Sauron to attempt to move west out of Mordor for a long time. Galadriel's sea-longing grew so strong in her that, though she deemed it her duty to remain in Middle-earth while Sauron was still unconquered, she determined to leave Lorinand and to dwell near the sea. She committed Lorinan to Amroth, and passing again through Moria with Celebrian, she came to Imladris, seeking Celeborn. There, it seems, she found him, and there she dwelt together for a long time. And it was then that Elrond first saw Celebrian and loved her, though he said nothing of it. It was while Galadriel was in Imladris that the council referred to above was held, but at some later time, Galadriel and Celeborn, together with Celebrian, departed from Imladris and went to the little inhabited lands between the mouth of the Guathlo and Ethir Anduin. There they dwelt in Belfalas, at the place that was afterwards called Dol Amroth. There Amroth, their son, at times visited them, and their company was swelled by Nandorin elves from Lorinand. It was not until far on in the Third Age when Amroth was lost and Lorinand was in peril, that Galadriel returned there in the year 1981.